Good morning. In case you haven't noticed, there's a few things different going on at church today. Can you smell that? Can yeah. you smell that in the air? Can you smell a little bit, yeah. For those of you who don't know, I'm Derek Armstrong. I'm the senior pastor here at Word of Grace, and joining me today is Dave Weed. He is the guy that is in charge of our missions here at Word of Grace. He's our missions director, and he is also leading a team that's going to go to Mexico here in just a few weeks. And Dave, could you tell everybody this morning, maybe those who might not know just a little bit, about what we're doing and the missionaries, and, and just, just let them know a little bit about all that. Yeah, this is our fourth year going down to Puebla, Mexico. It's in the southern tip of Mexico. Uh, we go to an orphanage down there. Uh, it's called Living Hope International is the, uh, the ministry and the organization. Um, I think this trip will hit about 75 people who have now gone down from this church and you know some of friends and relatives of people from this church. Uh, it's just been a, a shot of of just fresh air and fresh spirit. When uh, the teams go down there, they come back, they bring that back to the church. The church has just really rallied around these trips. It's been just a, an amazing, I guess, God adventure the last few years. And um, this the event today, the, uh, the silent auction and the, the food is uh, just part of the fundraising. Obviously, there's a component that we need to uh, pay to send uh, people down, and so we're all raising our own support. There's 23 people going down uh, June 15th. For, uh, for a one-week trip, and uh, there's actually going to be back-to-back weeks, so it's, it's kind of grown as more and more people want to be involved. Uh, it's just been a real neat experience for both the church and uh, those who go, and, uh, you know, they always say that those who you go to visit, you know, you're going to minister to them, but it's the people that go that so often come back with their lives just, just rocked for Christ, and uh, so it's been neat to see what it's done for this church and those individuals for, uh, for sure who have gone. Yeah, you know, and this morning, we... We want to do more than just talk about Mexico. We want to do more than just talk about, you know, auctions and food, even though some of you may be getting distracted by some of the smells. Um, I don't know, Mexican food at 930 in the morning right now. I don't, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, I want us this morning to focus on hope. And we want to talk just for a little bit about extending hope to others. And that's that's really why I had Dave come up here today, not only share with you about Mexico, but to also let you guys know about how you and I can extend hope to others. And so with that being said, I'm going to start off this morning. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll start reading there. I'm going to set this up for you. 2 Corinthians 5 was written by the Apostle Paul. He was writing a letter to the Corinthian church, and he wrote this to the Corinthians while he was at Ephesus. So he was quite a ways away from the Corinthians, and he loved the Corinthian church because he founded that church, and he was, had a, just a deep passion, a deep love for that church. But since he had been away for so long, and he kept trying to come back, but things kept hindering, kept getting in, in the way, all of a sudden the Corinthians were questioning whether or not Paul was the real deal. They were questioning whether or not he really cared about him. And so they were putting out all these accusations against him. And there were a few in the church that rose up against Paul, even though he was far away. And they were beginning to say things like, Paul doesn't care about us. Paul doesn't uh, love us. Paul doesn't, you know, uh, really mean all the things that he has said in the past. And so Paul wrote this letter in response to all of these accusations. And he was telling them about the defense for his ministry and and he was reminding them what he is doing and more importantly than what he was doing, he was reminding them why he was doing what he was doing. So with that being said, let's read this here, 2 Corinthians 5 and let's start in verse 17. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and he has given who? Us. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And and what does that mean? Verse 19 explains it. He says that means, that is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to who? The word of reconciliation. Now here's the cool part. Verse 20. Now then, because of all this, We're ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. For he made made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, 
Through this scripture, we see Paul writing this letter, and you understand a little bit of the background, and he's letting them know, this is why we're doing this. This is why I do what I do. This is why I'm pouring my heart out to you. This is why I have been trying to get to you and writing these letters to you, because what has been done for me, what has been done in my life, what has happened in my life, how Christ has radically saved my life and changed me and reconciled me Back to him through Jesus Christ. Now I've got the responsibility. And not only does Paul have that responsibility, but he lets everyone else know. You have the responsibility to extend the same hope that was extended to you. And that's what I want to share with you this morning, that we have an opportunity to offer hope. To give others hope. We have an opportunity to offer this hope that we have, that we've been given. We've got that opportunity now to offer that to others. This is the why. This is the very reason that Paul is saying, this is why I do what I do. That's a very important question that each, each and every one of us need to ask ourselves is why are we doing what we're doing? You know, why am I going to go to Mexico? Why am I going to invite this person to church? Why am I going to give some money to this ministry or that ministry? Why am I doing what I'm doing? What's really the motivation and the intention of my heart. Because you and I might fool one another, but you know who we're not fooling? We're not fooling God. He sees right through us. He sees right through all of our words. He sees right through all of our actions. He sees right through us. You know, we think that we can just fool him, and no, that's not how it works. You see, it's not just by these good deeds. It's by what's in your heart. You, you remember there's a story in the Bible that talks about a widow, and she gave two little coins that's all she had but yet there were all these other rich guys that were just dumping all this gold and all this stuff into the offering plate they were just dumping it all and look at all this stuff i'm giving and oh i'm being such a blessing to the church oh look at all this stuff i'm doing and this widow gave too and jesus said that lady right there just gave more than all of those guys what what are you talking about are you kidding me let's look at the numbers let's look at the spreadsheet here jesus i don't think so he said no this lady gave all she had She gave from the sincerity of her heart. And let me tell you, folks, to reach this world and offer hope to this world, we've got to be some real, genuine, sincere people. Amen? Because that's what the world's looking for. The world's not just looking for another handout. They're looking for somebody who cares. Somebody who's really going to offer hope. Someone who's really going to extend that. And you know who's best to extend hope to someone else? Somebody who's been given hope themselves. Have you and I been given hope? Have we been given a better way through Jesus Christ? Of course we have. Amen. Woo! About to jump up out of this chair. Of course we have. But because of that, he said, because of that, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, it's now our responsibility to be Jesus' hands and feet in the earth. You know, Just because we see the responsibility and we've been given the responsibility to extend hope, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to do it. Surprise, surprise. Doesn't mean that everybody's going to do it. You, You see, I believe that for us to be motivated to do something for God, that we have to redefine what hope looks like. We have to redefine what that word even means because to some of us, we may have a different definition of hope but for us to extend that we've got to understand that and dave what does that really mean you know we talk about hope we talk about living hope we talk about doing things for other people we talk about taking trips to mexico we talk about praying for our missionaries we talk about participating in events like what we're doing today but what does it really mean to offer hope and to extend hope i think there's it's important for us to kind of identify there's two kinds of definitions for hope (laughs) That there's hope, I hope this relationship fulfills me. I hope that this job works out. I hope, hope the world sees hope as a wish. Yeah. A wish that something turns out. But the biblical kind of hope is a very different kind of hope. Um, you know, in, the, uh, in Romans 5, I don't know if we have that, that verse up there. Um, it says, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but also rejoice in our suffering. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance perseverance character and character hope and hope does not disappoint us you know and so often i think us christians we grab on to that that's hope that's the hope that will never disappoint us but what does that really mean and i think like so many 
uh, examples throughout Scripture, Jesus first lived it out for us. Jesus showed us what that means. You know, and we just went through Easter, and we went through, um, you know, that, that real intimate time of the year where we really uh, reflect on that. And Jesus on the cross, that's where the suffering happened. So Jesus was suffering on the cross. And then what did his suffering do? He persevered. He stayed on the cross. He could have come off the cross. He could have zapped them all dead right there. He could have done who knows what. But he persevered. He stayed on the cross. And then furthermore, okay, so he persevered. Perseverance produces character. And what did we see from Jesus on the cross? We saw his character come out. We saw him giving mercy from the cross. We saw him asking God to forgive them for they didn't know what they were doing. So God was showing us his character after his suffering and asked for he was persevering. And why? Because he had the hope. Jesus had that confidence, that security, knowing that the resurrection was right around the corner. He knew that that, that was not the end. He knew there was more. And so he just kind of lived it out for us just in that, that brief three days even of his suffering, his perseverance, his character shining through, and then his giving us hope. And um, that's not the natural response, though. Like down in Mexico, we see kids who have come through all kinds of neglect and abuse and, and things that are just unspeakable. And um, the natural cycle is suffering produces, what, fear or depression or, um, you know, worse, it, it turns into hurt, it turns into anger, revenge. That's the natural response to suffering. And so this isn't a natural, oh, suffering always turns into hope. It doesn't work that way. You know, you hear or you've heard before where hurt people hurt people, and that's so true. And so until you break that cycle and offer that hope that Jesus lived out, that he, he showed us, it's going to be just that vicious cycle. And so it's a matter of presenting that hope in the gospel and in our own lives and showing that character of Christ through what we do, whether it be down in Mexico, whether it be at our, at our job or wherever it might be, it's living that out. That's what people are going to see as that hope. You know, and we're all at different stages of understanding and different stages of, of where we've put that hope in our life. Is that hope just a feel-good term, or is that hope truly what Paul ta calls the hope of the church is the resurrection? It's all of us. That is our hope. We are all going to be resurrected someday to be in eternal and perfect peace with Christ. We're going to have that same resurrection that Christ endured and that went through. And so... Like the kids down there are no different than us. They're all at different stages of, of their cycle. Some are just fresh off the streets. We just got a newsletter the other day from Living Hope where they've got a couple of new kids who are some of the, the roughest or rowdiest uh, that they've ever had. Others, and I, most of the people who've been down to Mexico can attest to the, the hope just beaming through the kids' faces and through their eyes, those who have understood the hope and grasped it and made it their own. You'll see that we're all wearing our team shirts, and it's that shine concept that when, when people go down there, that's one of the, the first things they'll explain or they'll describe the kids that they just shine, they beam, and that's because they understand that hope. And people are drawn to that, but we have to be genuine, like you said, and it's, mm -hmm. it's revealed through our character, and our character is because of what we go through and the, the uh, circumstances in our life and how we apply them. Right, and, and I love this verse here. There, there at the very end, we all need to really grab a hold of what that's saying there at the end. Hope that doesn't disappoint. People put a lot of hope in a lot of different things. And a lot of times, whenever you view hope or you define hope as that wishful thinking, you're going to get disappointed. I hope I win the lottery. You're probably going to get disappointed. I hope that I get to go on American Idol and I'm the next pop star. I had a friend that actually auditioned for American Idol. Uh, two friends, actually, they went together. And uh, one was a guy and one was a girl. And both of them were just fantastic singers. One was a lot better than the other. The girl can just flat out sing. She has some videos on YouTube that will just blow your mind. I mean, she's just incredible. And she said that how they do that at American Idol when you go to try out is to basically go through the selection process. They give you just a few seconds to sing something, and then they'll go, you, 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 and then you get to move on to the next round before they'll even put you before a judge. And not everybody gets to go before all the judges, you know, like you see on TV. And this girl, she just belted out this incredible five seconds worth of a song, and nope, 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 you, 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 let's go to the next level. And she said that's how it worked, because there's thousands of people there. 
Now, if I put my hope in something silly like that and thought, you know, this is going to be my ticket... You know, we, we see all these movies that warm our heart about this little orphan or this person that just gets to go up through this amazing system and then all of a sudden somebody having Daddy Warbucks comes and rescues little orphan Annie and we just, tomorrow, tomorrow, I love ya. Uh, and we just feel so warm and fuzzy inside. That's not how this stuff works because that hope will disappoint if you think that's what's going to happen to you. A lot of times we view our life or other people's lives is some type of fairy tale adventure and, and it's not we've got to give them hope that doesn't disappoint and there's only one hope that i know of that is consistent that's constant that consistently will give someone a better hope for a better future and it's not wishful thinking amen that's the hope that is jesus christ now redefining hope means abandoning stereotypes that would bring intimidation because stereotypes of hope, that, that's, that's going to intimidate us. You know, uh, Jesus is well aware of your personality. Do you think he knows your personality? He, he's, well, uh, he's well aware of all of your personality quirks and all of your little uh, things that set you off. He's wor- he, he knows everything about you. He knows everything about your personality. Now, do you think, just think with me for a minute, do you think that Jesus, knowing your personality would expect something out of us in his word nonetheless that says that we are all ambassadors for christ and that excludes us because of our personality because you see we buy into this stereotype that oh to offer hope to someone or to reach out to someone i've got to be a public speaker or i've got to have this personality that's just real outgoing and so when we don't fit the stereotype of someone that we believe can offer hope i don't have enough money i don't have enough this i'm not good enough at this and i can't do that and so because of that we'll allow that to keep us from doing anything at all because it intimidates us Buying into the stereotype will bring intimidation. So you've got to redefine what hope is, or other words, you're going to constantly be falling into this trap. Now, think with me about what I just said about Jesus knowing your personality. Do you think that Jesus knowing your personality, still being bold enough to allow something to be written in his word that you and I would read thousands of years later, do you think that he believes that that's only for a few people, or do you believe that the us he was talking about was every one of us. He said that if you have been reconciled to God through Christ, that you have now been given the ministry of reconciliation. So in other words, Jesus is saying, regardless of your personality, regardless of your excuses, regardless of the things that you would allow to hold you back. That's why we've got to redefine what hope is and what it looks like you know if god's called us all then listen to me there's something that we can all do and it is all significant and it is all needed amen if, if he's called us all to this ministry of reconciliation and he's not just saying oh well let's see uh, you 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 and you you've got good personalities and and you can do this or you've got a lot of money you you and you can do this or you, you and you seem real spiritual, you know, you know, floating around spiritual, you know, just always, you know, can't take a bath because you're walking on water spiritual, right? That type. I'll let that catch up with some of you. <laughs> some of us limit what we think God can do through us because of those personalities or because of our past god can't use me because of my past and you've got to redefine what hope is it's not wishful thinking it's not even based on a certain personality or certain skill set there's something we can all do check this out i'll prove it to you in scripture in ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16 i love this this is one of my favorite chapters in the bible is ephesians chapter 4 because i believe that it really spells out for us the purpose of the church in the earth today Ephesians 4 and verse 16 says, From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working, by which every part does what? Does it share. It causes what? Growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. 
It's not just talking about growing one church. It's talking about growing the body of Christ. How many of you guys know that God is into growing the body of Christ? He is into adding more people to the body of Christ because that means that's less people that are on their way to a road without Christ that's going to lead them to an eternity in hell apart from Christ. You know that he is more interested in getting people in his kingdom and growing his kingdom. And then once you're in his kingdom, you growing in your relationship with him. And then once you do that as you're growing, then you begin to help bring others in. That's what he wants. That's what he sees. And that's what he's saying. Whenever everybody does their share, it causes growth of his body, of the body of Christ. Everybody is significant and everybody has a part. Now, I want you to say this with me and I want you to say it where you really believe it. Say, I'm a minister, and I have a ministry. You know, that's the thing that you and I have got to understand. He said, every one of us have been given the ministry of reconciliation. He didn't say those that have a title. He didn't say those that have been to seminary. He didn't say those that have a plaque hanging on their wall or have been prayed over or prophesied over. He didn't say that. He said, everyone who has received hope is responsible to give hope. You are a minister of hope. And you have a ministry to offer hope to others. What does that look like? I don't know. I don't know what it may look like for you as an individual. It may be in some public speaking arena. It may be in your prayer closet on your knees. It may be reaching out to someone who is hurting at work. I don't know what it looks like to you. But every one of us have that responsibility to redefine what hope is. And not buy into the stereotype so we can be more effective because I believe there's something we can all do because every one of us is needed. Every, every single one of us. Um, Dave, we were talking about extending hope. I mean, explain to everybody this morning, I guess, how hope is, is, is something, it's, it's more than words. It's more than just an idea. I mean, it, it, explain that to us. Sure. Um. Well, when you mentioned that we all have that responsibility, We're, we meet as a Mexico team uh, every couple of weeks, and we are preparing our hearts, we're preparing logistics, we're preparing that stuff. And the last chapter in our book that we're kind of going through is about listen to their story and be ready to tell yours. And, you know, yeah. Scripture is clear that be prepared, be ready to give an account for the hope that you have. People will ask. And uh, last year, it was neat, we, um, we got to do some street evangelism down there where we were just kind of roaming uh, in, a, in an area where uh, we were paired up in little groups and we were picking up trash and just kind of looking for opportunities, looking for people to talk with and share with. And it was neat because some of the, the teenage uh, kids from the orphanage who have either grown up in or, um, you know, are part of the orphanage were along with us, just kind of mixed in with our, with our teams. And... To see them take their story, you know, we talked about intimidation or those stereotypes. If anyone had an excuse to feel apprehensive about reaching out or if anyone wanted a a reason not to put themselves out there and be vulnerable again, it would be these kids. But at the end of that, I'll say, two-hour session of, of kind of walking the streets, it was amazing to hear these teenage kids taking their story they were recounting it to us afterwards of telling of different opportunities they had, but so many of them had a chance to share and relate to people that were homeless or that were just in down and outs or whatever. They were able to use their story and share the hope that they had, that real, genuine hope. And um, it's just amazing to see that coming full circle. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I shared uh, back in... Uh, December, when we were sending out our missionary uh, gifts for the end of the year. I don't know if most of you recall, we, we kind of dedicate those extra gifts at the end of the year to our missionaries. I told a story about a little girl named Evelyn. I don't know if you recall the story, but Evelyn, uh, back in July, when our team was down there, uh, her mother came back to the orphanage to take her back home. You know, and a lot of us were were very, we had guarded optimism, you know, that it's great that they go home to their family. That's the way it's intended to be. But we all had sort of that earthly, mm, boy, I hope this works out, you know, going back to hope. Uh, we really, you know, it was neat to see all the kids pray over Evelyn and her brother as they were sent out. You know, and that was probably the most touching moment many of us team members had ever seen is 40 little kids laying hands on and praying away this little girl and her brother back to a life of being with her family. Well, the follow-up story is I just want to give you a little update on Evelyn. Uh, it was a couple of months after that uh, she went home where 
it got word back to the orphanage that um, Emma, her older brother, had been sent off to slave labor and abuse to a, a family member. And Evelyn was in the same situation. They had stopped um, bringing her for visits. They had taken her out of school. She was right back to where she was many years before when her mother was trying to sell her on the streets. And um, so it's this heartbreaking story. But on Christmas Day, if you recall Christmas Day, this year was on a Sunday, this last year. And the mother brought Evelyn to the church. The church is part of the Living Hope organization. There's a church of about five or 600. It's a thriving church down there. The mother brought Evelyn to church. Just, I guess that's what you should do. You should go to church on, on Christmas. And the kids and the staff just flocked to that family, to, to Evelyn and her mother. And the mother was just so brokenhearted just by the hope. The hope was just tangible. She could feel it. She knew that she was not giving Evelyn this opportunity to cultivate that hope in her life. And so hope is not just this whimsical, abstract thing. Ab a true hope is tangible, I feel. And that day, the mother went home with Evelyn, went and got Emma, her brother, out of the situation he was in and brought them both back to the orphanage that day and dropped them off and, and just... It took a lot of courage on her behalf to, to admit that and to take that, but she knew that they were getting what they needed, and she saw the hope in the staff and in the kids' eyes of those who just rallied around Evelyn on her return. So that's kind of the full circle there. You see how that hope is just something that once you experience it, once you see that genuine true hope, it just draws you back and draws you, draws you in. And so that was, you know, there was, there was more suffering that happened that, that didn't need to and shouldn't have happened, but you can see it was all for that greater, that greater calling, that greater purpose, that greater calling back of Evelyn and her mom to living hope. And so I think it's just neat to see how the kids have that, that power. That kid, you know, hope is not an age-specific thing. Right. It's not a, hey, if you're a charismatic person kind of thing. These kids have been through all ranges of, of a background, but yet they've used that for the benefit uh, of sharing God, the gospel and that sharing that hope. Wow. Well, you know, you think about things like that, and you think about what can we do? What's, what's our part of the story? We want to help those that are in those situations. We want to offer hope. I mean, just imagine if living hope wouldn't have been there, or the church wouldn't have been there. You know, I mean, this, 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 this takes us serving. This takes us praying. This takes us investing because we want to provide opportunities for people to be able to run to Christ and be able to run to those safe places, especially in a dangerous place like Mexico. And it just keeps getting more and more dangerous from the things that I read in the news. But the, the thing that we always need to remember about serving and giving and offering hope to others is that this is something we get to do this is something we get to do you know it's an honor to give ourselves to extend hope to others and that's what we always need to remember that it is an honor the apostle paul said it best he said in second corinthians 12 and 17 he said that i'm gonna glad he said oh that's a wrong scripture maybe it was first corinthians 12 and 17 let me look real quick. Doom, de doom, de doom, doom, de doom. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just, interject there and uh, just you know, take away the awkward pause. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> One thing that, uh, that I think is just a huge testimony, too, just kind of piggybacking on what I just shared, is that Living Hope has had 400 kids come through the orphanage and through the ministry there, and another 200 have come to their ministry school. They've got a ministry school for young adults. And of, that, of the kids and of the ministry school... More than 300 have now gone into full-time ministry. Wow. So of the kids, not 300 of the kids necessarily, some went there to get equipped, but 300 have now gone out to share that hope. Wow. So they have just continued to pay it forward. They see the opportunity to share that, and they just feel it's that compelling. It's an opportunity to share. It's that natural outflow of what God has done in their life that they just want to share. You write this down in your notes. 2 Corinthians 12 and 17 is correct. Pastor Derek was right. Um, <clears throat> what's up on the screen is 1 Corinthians 12 and 17. Uh, but 2 Corinthians 12 and 17 says this. Um, it says, oh, maybe I was wrong. I was wrong. I don't have any more stories right now teed up. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. Anyways, the scripture I was trying to get out there, I thought it, it, it was weird. Anyways, we'll fix it before the second service. So come back and, and we'll fix it. Okay. 
Apostle, the Apostle Paul, he said that I will gladly spend and be spent for your souls. That's one of the things that he said in one of the Corinthian letters. And uh, he said, I'll gladly spend and be spent for your souls. This is something that he understood as an honor to do. This is something that he understood was absolutely uh, just, it, it, this is an honor. Even though he, he goes on to say in the scripture that even though the more I love you, the more you hate me. He was referring to the Corinthian church. They were badgering him and they were giving him a hard time about not caring for him and all that stuff. He said, listen, guys, I will gladly spend and I will gladly be spent for your souls. And that's exactly the attitude that you and I are supposed to take in extending and offering hope to others. This is something we will gladly do. I will gladly be spend and be spent. You know, a lot of times we, we want to invest in things where we feel an immediate return. We want to do something where we can get an immediate payback or that immediate, oh, that felt good doing that. Oh, that just warms my little heart. But sometimes this stuff takes a while. It takes investing because there's hardness in people's hearts. There are situations that you and I don't understand, things that they have been through, that they need someone to help reach out to them continually. I'll, I'll tell you a perfect case and uh, point here on this. Whenever we started a church in Texas, we had a huge outreach ministry to the homeless. And I, I have had uh, so many homeless people packed in my minivan, bringing them to church. And I'd make two trips sometimes uh, downtown and just pick them up at different places. And there was this one homeless guy. His name was Danny. And um, I, I, I wanted to fix Danny so bad. You, you know, I wanted him to change so bad. He had been on the streets since 2002. He was 50 years old. And his dad was one of the richest men in town. He was a big uh, property developer. His brother was also very wealthy. He ran a, uh, a ear clinic where he would uh, make custom uh, hearing aids and things like that. And so he comes from a very wealthy family, but Danny had a problem. He, he was addicted to drugs, and, and, and his mom passed away. Uh, a few years back and he just he couldn't take it he couldn't live with his dad they couldn't get along so he decided to live on the street he'd been living on the streets for 12 years and 12 years of hardness 12 years of anger 12 years of addiction 12 years of brokenness and i think i'm gonna fix this guy in an instant you know what i'm saying uh, so so that that's the thing we're not supposed to get weary and well-doing here's what i did one day i was taking danny back to the homeless shelter and he was riding with me and my uh, assistant pastor and we were talking to him and i just decided i was just going to man up and ask him a question danny what's it going to take to get you off these streets we need to get you off these streets danny what what do we need to do and he just clams up and he, well i don't know I, you know i, I don't i don't really know you know just and he, he wouldn't talk to me and then i went to the homeless shelter the next week to go pick danny up he wasn't there i asked everybody I said where's danny we don't know i didn't see danny for three months and then all of a sudden, I just saw him walking down the street one day, and I pulled my car over to the side, and I got out and talked, where you been, man? Oh, you know, just I've been around, and oh, I need to come get you for church. Yeah, okay, I'll come next week. I, I realized something in that instant. You see, I had tried to fix Danny on my own. Danny didn't need me to fix him. Danny needed me to love him right where he was and show him hope. That's what Danny needed. And so that's what I began to do. I began to say, okay, well, well, I think I actually pushed him away by trying to fix him. By trying to be that instant, I thought, let's just, let's get this over with. No more homelessness. Let's, let's just get the whole thing fixed right here. 12 years of hurt, 12 years of heartache, 12 years of drug addiction, and I'm going to fix it with one question? I, I, I don't think so. Not if he's at that place where he's ready and willing to change. He's, he's, he's not going to do it. By me asking him, what's it going to take to get you off of these streets? So I began to love him. I began to let him know we cared about him. I began to treat him like everybody else in the church. He didn't get any special treatment. He didn't get treated worse or, or better than anyone else. He was just another guy. And one day, about probably six months later, um, Danny always, uh, this is a little side story, it's just funny. Danny, uh, Dan, Danny always wanted a jar of peanut butter once a week because he went and gave plasma at the plasma lab and your protein had to be up. He'd eat the whole jar of peanut butter and then he'd go give plasma so he could get a little money. I thought that was hilarious. It has nothing to do with anything. But <coughs> he'd go, hey, hey, hey Dirk, can I, can I get a meal? Uh, jar of peanut butter? Uh, yeah, Danny, I'll go get you a jar of peanut butter. 
<laughs> he's hilarious. He, he hung around the laundromats, and, and, and I said, why are you hanging out in the laundromat? But he said, because everybody has change there. He, says, he said, I'm a panhandler. That's where I panhandle is at the laundromat. He said, I know how to ask, can I have a quarter in Chinese, Spanish, and English? <laughs> <laughs> this guy was a pro. But uh, <laughs> Anyways, I'm preaching one day in the church, and Danny lifts his hand right in the middle of my message. And I'm like, yes, sir. Can I help you, Danny? I'd like to say something. Okay. Sure, Danny, I, I took a chance. I took a risk. What, what, what do you got to say? He stood up and he said, I just want everybody here to know that I really love this church and I really appreciate everybody here. He said, because whenever I'm here with all of you, he said, I don't feel like I'm homeless. He said, I don't feel the hurt and the pain. I don't feel like I'm rejected by society. He said, I don't feel like I'm homeless when I'm here. He said, and that's all I wanted to say. And he sat down. And I wouldn't even preach anything that had to do with that. Light bulb went off. That's all he needed. Was somebody to plant a seed of love. Somebody to offer him hope. Not somebody to sit there and demand change out of him and try to fix all of his little quirks and all of his stuff. He needed somebody to reach out to him. And, love. and you know, sometimes, folks, we get weary in well-doing. Sometimes because we don't get the instant feedback and the instant payback, we just throw our hands up in the air and go, oh, well, that's not worth it. Let me tell you, folks, people are worth it. I can do it sitting down just as well as I can standing up. People, people are worth it. We get to do this, okay? So we need to let others know that there's still hope for them, no matter what their situation. Your coworker, listen to me, needs to know that there is hope because they're battling depression. The cashier at Target today, she needs to know that somebody cares because she doesn't know if her marriage is going to work out or not. Your, your neighbor needs to know that Jesus is real, and it's our responsibility to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Um, Dave, you know, the, the Bible says, as much as we've done it unto the least of these, so we've done it unto him no matter what we do no matter how we serve and you know jesus was putting that emphasis on the less fortunate but he was also trying to tell something else too he was trying to communicate something else to us could you just talk about that for a minute right um i really like the i always go back to james i, I love the the book of james um and in james you know we talked about the hands and feet of jesus well james knew the hands and feet of jesus right james was jesus kid brother yep you know, and I've shared with the, the church before that how intimidating must that be to be the kid brother of Jesus? And yet in his book, he says that, you know, he's kind of refuting the, uh, the hypocrisy in the church. You know, he talks about religion, not salvation. He talks about religion. True religion is this, that you look out for the widows, the orphans, that you serve each other. That's how you can serve Christ. And so James, who grew up with Jesus and then followed him in his, in his ministry, that was the one thing that he gleaned from, from all those years with Jesus, that it's about serving. It's about people. You know, it's not about um, these, these lofty, uh, huge, abstract ideas. It's about serving people. And so James, the brother of Jesus, saw that lived out daily. He saw the emphasis that Christ put on that. And so much of what Jesus uh, talked about and his miracles were always to the less fortunate. They were to the homeless. They were, they were not to the, the influential, the difference makers in society. They were to the, to the lowly. And, um, you know, it talks about in the end times where he's going to separate out and he's going to say, you know, hey, if you, brought, if you served man, if you gave someone something to eat, something to drink, if you visited someone in jail, if you've cl helped clothe, if you've done that for your fellow man, You've served me. You know, and that's just so, so deep that he would go down to that, that all of his religion, the, the, the faith in action, would come down to that. And it, it's just a, an incredible kind of full circle. You know, and so many books right now, there's a lot of books out there where it's talking about the American lifestyle and how, how dare we live like this. You know, these are Christian books. How dare we live like this while poverty is going on there? You know, and they talk the numbers. They talk, you know, you see the pie charts. And if we would all do this, then the world would be solved. And, yeah. you know, Christ makes it clear that poverty will always be. Mm -hmm. But yet it's our job to do what we can. It's not about 
doing something out of guilt because there's a billion people in this situation and there's 200 million Americans in this situation. It's not about guilt. It's about once we understand the hope, we just want to. It's that natural outflow. So that hope is the outflowing. That is the religion in action. Yeah, like Bill Gates can buy everybody in the entire world a pair of skates. Did you know that? So why doesn't he? <laughs> kind of one of those statistics. That has nothing to do with anything you were talking about. I thought we could kind of work that in somewhere. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> but, you know, today you, you've got an opportunity and I've got an opportunity to extend hope. You know, we all can do something. That's what we need to recognize is that whether it's something at our job, whether it's something with a family member, whether it's something when you um, go uh, to Walmart today or whatever you do, whether you bid on an auction item, whether you go and get you a, a plate of delicious Mexican food, which continues to smell better and better the longer that you sit here and the hungrier that you get. You know, it's about something that we can do to extend hope. We're having our Cinco de Mayo fundraiser here to send our team to Mexico. So listen, what does that have to do with me extending hope to somebody? Well, let me tell you. Luke 12 and 34 says that where your treasure is there, your heart is also. And that just doesn't mean your money. That means your time. That means your effort, your treasure. Out where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. You, you, do you know what your money really represents anyways? It represents your life. Because you gave your employer some time from your life, and in exchange for that time from your life and your skills and your efforts, they in turn give you that money. So whenever you give your money to someone like Living Hope or whenever you participate in a fundraiser like this, it's you putting part of your hard-earned life, your, your, your hard-earned money that you've earned with giving your life away. You're giving that part of what you say. You know, I exchanged my time for this money, but yet I think it's more valuable to give this money in exchange to extend hope to someone else. So don't just look at it as, oh, I'm just giving a donation. No, no, no. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And that means when you spend the precious precious treasure of your time you you guys realize that's one of those commodities we can't go out and work for more of that's not something that you can exchange for more of your time is what it is and when you give it away that's something precious you're giving away your heart you're giving away your life so what are you investing in with your heart what are you investing in with your time the bible says where your treasure is there your heart is also now listen when you pray and you stand in the gap you pray for this team. You pray for living hope. You're giving your time for someone else. All this fundraising that, that Dave and Alyssa have been doing, God's been giving them creative ideas when you get involved. When you're being an, ambas an, an ambassador for Christ, you know, it really does, and it really is making a difference. It really is making a difference. And, and, and Dave, the things that we do, no matter how big or small, they always are making a difference. Every time, that's why a lot of times people think that, oh, well, all I can do, do is my two mites of time or my two mites of, of money or whatever I can do. Every part is significant. Amen? Do you really believe that? Amen. Amen. It really is. You know, but more important than anything that we do, more important than tacos and dolls and TVs and whatever else we've got out here, there's hope through Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the light. The hope that you and I have experienced, the hope that you and I have seen through Christ, the hope that we have, that you and I walk in, it's not something that we've made up. It's not something that we've been able to put together. It's something that only comes from God. Amen? Amen. And there's no other way. There's no other way to find true hope. Uh, Dave, share Ephesians, what, what Ephesians says with them there. Um, I believe it's Ephesians 3. Yeah, yeah, Ephesians 3, 7. You know, you talked about hope comes through, through Christ, and that is the only true hope. <laughs> Ephesians 3, 7 and 9 says, By God's special gift of grace given to me through his power, 
I became a servant to tell that good news. I am the least important of all God's people, but God gave me this gift to tell those who are not Jews the good news about the riches of Christ, which are too great to understand fully. I love how Paul puts that. Did you catch that? God gave me this gift to tell those the gospel. The gift is the opportunity. The gift that Paul perceives, the gift that God, that God has given to Paul was, yes, that salvation, yes, that hope of resurrection. But here he says the gift is the opportunity to do something with it. Not to just bottle it up, not to just sit on it, but the task is ours, it's his. It was Paul's and it's ours to now pay that forward. You know, everybody's at a different stage. Not everybody's received the first gift. Not everybody's received the, the, the initial gift of hope. A lot of people just hope that when they die, they go to heaven. A lot of people hope that things will just turn out in this life if they're a good person. But that's not true hope. That's worldly hope. So the, the true hope really comes down to, do you have that assurance of salvation? Do you know that that resurrection of you is right around the corner? When you die or when Christ returns, that's when the resurrection, that's the hope. That's the hope that we can have. And so it's just so important, I think, to, to really understand our role. It's an opportunity. It is that privilege. And not everybody has, ex has received that. And that's where we need to go to Mexico. We need to be that tangible bit of hope to those that might make a difference. Maybe it's some people on our team who are going to just come back seeing what hope looks like in a whole new way and, and just come back with a renewed vigor for sharing that hope and, and truly understanding what they can do with it and the power that it has in their life. Amen. Church, would you bow your heads with me this morning? Maybe you're here in this place today and you say, Pastor Derek, I need hope. I... I came in here today looking for something real. I came in here looking for something tangible. I came in here needing hope. I need to experience that grace and that forgiveness and that hope that Christ offers. If that's you in this place today, maybe you said, I, I, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I'm ready to grab a hold of the hope that he's offering me. Or maybe you say, I, I, I have grabbed a hold of that hope before. I have received that before. But, you know, it's, it's really been a long time since I felt like I've really been genuine with it. And I want to be genuine today. And I just want to reaffirm that commitment and just renew that and start today anew and not look back. I want to move forward into the hope that he has set before me. If that's you and you're here in this place, not going to embarrass you. I just want you to just simply let me know that you're here just by lifting your hand and putting it right back down. Anybody in this place today, Pastor, I need hope. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. Anybody else? I'm, I'm looking around. Yep, I see that hand. Anybody? I see that hand. Anybody else in this place today? Church, would you join me in praying this prayer? Dear Jesus, you are hope, and I receive your hope where there's been no hope. Forgive me for my sins. Make me new. Make me right with you. And help me to have the strength to live for you every day, no matter how hard, no matter how difficult my situation may be. I say today that I trust in you because you are my hope. You're my Savior. You're my God. I put all my trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer today, we would like to...